Hey everyone, it's Nurse Danny, and if you joined us last week, then you remember Riley and Camaro and Talia. They are delightful young women. That's the word I used last week because they truly are delightful. And we also have Dr. Smith from Budge OB in Logan, Utah, who's with us today. She's our expert who's going to expound on some questions that um, actually came up. You guys got these from teenagers, mm -hmm. yourself, your peers. Yeah. So I want you to explain for those who may have missed the live stream last week what your project is, how we all got to this point, and tell everyone a little bit about yourself. So. Mm -hmm. Riley, we'll start with you. Okay, so pretty much we're just in a marketing group at our high school and we wanted to focus on teen health for women because there's a lot of um, maturation programs for those who are younger and there's the amazing IHC Moms program that we all see, but we don't get a lot of focus on our age. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So we really just wanted to highlight that we're important too. Yeah. And so that's why we're here and we just want to discuss with you and make sure that everyone knows what's going on and how to take care of themselves. Um, yeah. I'm in student government and we're all in a broadcasting group at school and so that's, yeah, that's about me. Yeah. <laughs> and what do you want to be when you grow up? We kind of talked uh, about this last week. But. When I grow up, I want to be an international journalist. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm Camaro Holt. And um, I kind of realized that, you know, like me personally, I had a lot of questions about like myself. And then I realized that the teenagers, the female teenagers around me had a lot of questions about themselves as well. And I was like, we need these questions answered, you know, and like not get them online. And so that was part of the reason why I was like, I want to do this project as well. Um, I like how you said not get it online, yeah. unless it's from Internet Moms or yeah. Facebook when I mean, we're talking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> because like, you can Google something and you don't yeah. know if it actually applies to you or if it doesn't. Yeah. We like we stores. refer to this as Dr. Yeah. Google a lot in the medical field, <laughs> awesome. and Dr. Google is dangerous. So <laughs> right. I'm glad that you brought that yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, I realized that. So I was like, we need to get it like real information. Um, and I want to be an actress when I grow up uh, because. Yeah, anything in the film industry, really, because that's like a far stretch, but I'd be happy with anything. So, yeah. Great, Talia. Okay, so um, what kind of got me into this project was just like, I'm very passionate on health and medicine as well. Like, I want to be either a nurse or something like that. And um, I think it's just really important that, uh, just how we were all saying, how it's really important to just like bridge that gap and make sure that everyone's getting all the information that we need. Even for myself, I have tons of questions, but like in a, how do you say, like a conventional way, of like actually talking to your doctor can kind of be quite intimidating and it, it's just yeah. kind of hard, especially when you're talking about some things that are very personal. It's kind of awkward, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's time, like especially that we're growing older and I think all other teenagers should know this information and so I think it's awesome that we're doing this so yeah great points if you have concerns you don't want to not bring them up just because you're worried about having that conversation yeah. <laughs> right like this shouldn't be awkward right <laughs> especially if your doctor is is dr smith she is awesome yeah. so tell us a little bit about yourself so i'm erica smith i'm an OBGYN at the budge clinic in logan utah um i have a special interest in pediatric and adolescent gynecology just because i think this is the formative years of a woman's life and we're changing so much at that time and a lot of our body image and our life goals all center in our adolescent teenage years and so I'm passionate about this group and so I'm happy to be here today to answer as many questions as I can. Awesome. We're really lucky to have you. Some good conversations are going to come from this. Yeah. So we'll just start going through some questions that um, yourself and other teens wanted to know about. The first topic is sleep. And um, I want, we just kind of started before we went live talking about how much sleep each one of these young ladies gets. So let's go down the line. Oh boy. Riley, how much sleep do you get on average per night? Very little, probably around six hours, I'd say. Around six yeah. hours, okay. Yeah. Average bedtime is? 10.30. 10.30 or so. Camaro, yeah. how about you? Uh, I'd say around six or seven hours as well. And then I go to bed like 10 on a good night. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Talia? Yeah, I would say six or seven. If I'm lucky, maybe 11, 11, 30, but most nights it's like 12 or 12, 30. <laughs> so how are these young ladies doing in the sleep department, <laughs> Dr. Smith? And so <laughs> reality is we should be striving for eight to 10 hours. Mm -hmm. um, we also realize that the body's clock in a teenager desires to sleep later. And mm -hmm. so most teenagers really don't feel an urge to go to sleep before 11 o'clock. And that's normal 
for the growing body. But ideally, we get about eight hours. School interferes. Yeah, it starts really early, so the key is getting to bed earlier. earlier. Mm -hmm. How about on the weekends? Is it possible for them to catch up on sleep that they've missed during the week and still have the benefits by sleeping in on the weekend? No, ideally the sleep hygiene cycle stays the same consistently mm -hmm. every day. And so hopefully you can kind of model it a little bit so that you can make small adjustments to the weekend but not the sleep till noon that we really want to do. Yeah. How about how about the difference between teenagers and adults, and when does that change? I'm not 100% certain when the timing changes, um, but as we age, our need to stay up later changes, and our sleep cycle tends to shift backwards a little bit, so that we get up earlier for work, but we also desire to go to mm. bed earlier. And so our ability to get our eight hours is easier because I don't have the urge to stay up to one. Mm. Uh huh. Except when my job necessitates it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's up in the middle of the night delivering babies. Yeah, that <laughs> complicates the ability to sleep. So sleep has a lot to do with our overall health. What are some of the main reasons why teenagers should try to get as much sleep as they need? Um, so growth spurts are happening. We're forming long-term memories. Um, we're trying to learn new things, and all of those things rely on healthy sleep to make long-term memory happen. We talked last week about priorities, right? We talked about exercise and eating mm -hmm. right being a priority. This week it's about sleep, and when we start piling on all the priorities, sometimes there's just so many you don't have time for everything, right? Mm -hmm. That's the complicated part about being a teenager and balancing everything. So what do you guys think about this information when it comes to sleep? We need to work on it more. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question though because there's like um, I was always wondering because you know people take naps. I feel like a lot of teenagers mm -hmm. will take naps, but they won't really focus on their whole sleep. Do you know if it's like beneficial to take naps or is it like it not? is beneficial to take naps, but it's important to schedule them at a time that they don't actually interfere with the sleep? desire to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. And so it's fine to take an afternoon nap to catch up, but you don't want to take it at 9 p.m. and then we're up till 2. It needs to be that the sleep hygiene schedule stays pretty set, but you were a little tired so you had a nap after you went to the gym in the afternoon. Oh, okay. That okay. makes sense. Yeah. How about bedtime routines? How important are those in kind of cluing your body into the fact that it's time for sleep and winding down? Very important and they're lifetime skills and so even as an adult, I have the urge to be like, oh, I need to check one more thing before I go to bed. But every time I pop that light on, I'm cluing my brain that I'm awake. And so it's important to realize, hey, I'm going to bed, the lights went out, my phone turned off, and I'm not gonna try to disrupt my body's ability to wind that down. And so at night, especially with our new light systems and screens, books and things are actually nice novel ideas. Then the ideas. bright screen shining in your face. Because it's not stimulating the brain yes. in the same way. How many of you look at your phones right before bed? Yeah, yeah I do. I'm guilty yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's research to say that that shouldn't be part of the our nighttime. routine. Yeah. yeah, okay, so we're all guilty on that. We could all do better on yeah. that, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> so another important part of the nighttime routine is usually like brushing your teeth and taking care of your face. And that was another uh, common question that a lot of teenagers had is how do I control acne? So um, expound on that a little bit. What is normal when it comes to puberty and teens and skin and how can they help control outbreaks? So part of puberty is something called adrenarche. The body makes hormones. And so these hormones result in an oilier skin type. And that's why young ladies and guys start to develop acne. It really isn't to do with that their skin's not clean, but part of the nighttime regimen of cleaning the skin reduces the amount of oil that's there. And since you're making extra, that extra oil can build up under the skin and the pores, and then that causes inflammation and the inflammation results in zits. So what's the best way? So just washing your, your face morning and night with? Um, so warm soap initially and so if you're not having any issues with breakouts you don't want to create an abnormal skin environment by either drying or creating more oil. Which is what a lot of the acne creams do is dry, dry. out your skin, right? And so they're trying to decrease that inflammation but in mm -hmm. the process of decreasing the inflammation they cause dryness which can also cause breakouts. And so it's important if your skin's okay, warm water, keep it clean, normal regimen. Any kind of soap or just? Um, just a non-astringent soap. And okay. that's really what most of the nightly washes are. There's not extra acne proof in them for a reason because if you don't need it, don't use it. 
Yeah. Okay, that's a good point because sometimes you think more is better, right? The stronger ones are Prevent better. It, but, yeah. but yeah, if you're okay, keep it okay. And then if you start to have that breakout, that's a sign of the inflammation, and so you're controlling the inflammation with the acne, the acids, like the salicylic acid and the mm. benzoyl peroxide. Keep the balance. <laughs> and so, but they, you don't want to use it too much. And so initially, you're using it one time at night before bed, not every time you go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when is it concerning, like, when should you go see a dermatologist for acne? And so when those things aren't working, so you've tried the one time at night and it's modifying, hey, I don't want to go out with friends. I'm not putting my picture up on Facebook. I'm, or Instagram. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or I'm afraid to go out in public. Of course, those those things should be addressed. We have ways to help control this other than just what's over the counter. Um, and the dermatologist is an expert at that. So they kind of look at each person's case um, individually and decide so what medication is gonna be best for them? Yes. So what questions do you guys have specifically about acne? Um, I was wondering, is like, because I've always been told uh, to moisturize my face, like, is that as important as people say it is? Or is it just like? Um, so moisturizing the face has a lot to do with that we're all afraid of wrinkles and we think that moisture decreases <laughs> the appearance of wrinkles. And so as women, we tend to moisturize. It's important to keep your skin moisture, we're moist. We're in a very dry climate. Mm -hmm. And so the drying of the skin will also result in breakouts. Um, but you can over moisturize as well and that can mm -hmm. clog pores too. And oh, so okay. it's important to keep, once you find the regimen that's working, you stay on it and find the treatment that's right for you. And a lot of times that really does require some expert advice along the way. Well, that's a good question. Do you guys have any other questions, Riley or Talia? So I know a lot of people use Accutane, but what are other options that teen have for medication to do that? And so um, a lot of times antibiotics are used. Um, that inflammation process often involves bacteria. And so we use antibiotics. We use um, hormone regulation, and so birth control pills are a lot of times used in young ladies to try to regulate the oils caused by the androgens. Um, and so I sometimes will get involved because we're treating with a birth control pill. There are other hormone regulators that can be added as well to try to decrease the amount of oil in the skin. Would you recommend a topical or birth control first? Uh, it depends on what we're trying to gain. So a lot of times when I see young ladies, we're working on acne, but we'd want to fix the period too. And so I can do both with a birth control pill. Um, and so the ability to regulate periods has its own appeal. And then I can tell you, hey, it's gonna start on this day if you follow the regimen of your pills and we're gonna have a period this many weeks apart and that becomes very important when your life involves sports and dance and mm -hmm. lots of important Makes things sense. that you don't want a period to interrupt. Yeah. And also there's like the, um, like it, there's such things like stress acne, right? Like it's not just when your body's going through changes, like it's also. And, and it has to do with that overall skin health and the oils that are accumulating at the time of that stress, yes. Oh, okay. Because the stress impacts all of your hormones. Oh, right, yeah. It's around the time of finals <laughs> sure. or whatever, everyone's breaking out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so speaking of periods, you were talking about how birth control can help regulate periods. Um, after a girl has her first period, it can be irregular for a little while, right? Right, so and so the average what's normal? lady, it's at least a year of very irregular periods, meaning sometimes 20 days, sometimes 90 days. Um, that first year, it's not expected to be regular. Um, and by regular, we mean like? Monthly. Okay. Within you know, 21 to 34 days of the next cycle. And most people can kind of time theirs. Mm -hmm. Not perfect, but within a couple of days so that you know to put the products in the purse. Yeah. So it's good to, I can't talk, it's good to track them. That would be good for them to start doing if they haven't already and just see if any patterns are emerging for them. Right, and it lets you know about your body and you can kind of predict, hey, my hormones are changing this week and my acne is a little different and then it's okay. This is part of the cycle of this is a different part of my hormones because we balance differently throughout the month. Um, 
And then if it's an issue and we're always seeing this pattern and it's not something that we personally want, then we have a way to change it. So what kind of bleeding patterns would be concerning? Like what should young ladies bring to the attention of their parents so that they can be seen by a doctor? So a period that doesn't go away. And so I see young ladies that sometimes they've been bleeding for four or six weeks and I think, oh my that's gosh, terrible. that's horrible. Oh How can you do that? Um, so if it just won't stop. And a lot of times we'll see that with a first period. Um, and that can be a sign that there actually is trouble stopping blood flow. And so that's an important thing. If the period doesn't go away, we should know about it. Or heavy. Or it's or too it's heavy. heavy. How would you define heavy? Um, so we define heavy easiest with pads. Lots of young people and older people like, like tampons, but it's mm -hmm. harder to quantify the amount of blood. And so if you start to fill up more than a pad an hour, that's concerning for heavy blood loss. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Do you guys have any questions about periods? Um, I had one. So, I mean, I suffer from very regular periods. So I was wondering, like, when would it be concerning, like, of how long you've gone without a period? Like, how long would that be? And so after that first year, if it's more than three months without a period, that's a sign we should talk. Um, okay. And a lot of times we'll regulate them just because long term, I want your uterus to be healthy so that 10, 15, 20 years from now, you can decide to use it for what it was meant for. Mm -hmm. um, but you can have abnormal growth of the lining inside if it doesn't shed every so often or it isn't controlled hormonally. And sometimes I put ladies on long-term birth control to keep them from having a period, which is okay. Mm -hmm. But if you're not on something that keeps your periods away, that's hormonal prescribed by a doctor, then you really should at least have a period every three months. Okay. okay. Um, I know I suffer from ovarian cysts because of irregular periods, so do you want to talk about that and yeah. how people can be affected? Yeah, and so they're terribly painful, and yeah. <laughs> typically the first time you have one, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm dying. Um, and we see lots of young ladies in the ER specifically because they have a cyst. Um, because of the cyst or because it's ruptured or both? Or? Both. Um, so it can just be there and it's hurting. Mm -hmm. It can be that it's there and it's twisted, which is an, mm -hmm. a medical emergency. Or it can be that it was there, it burst, and now we're dealing with the pain of the fluid that's inside the belly. Um, most of the time, your body is making a cyst monthly, and that's a normal process. And so every lady in the middle of the cycle makes a little tiny one and a half to two centimeter cyst that bursts. And if you were trying to be pregnant, you'd be excited because that meant you ovulated. But if you're not trying to and that cyst gets big, which sometimes we see in young ladies, it hurts. Um, we use birth control pills a lot to control this because I can, what the birth control does is it keeps the hormones level so that no ovulation occurs. And so that little tiny two centimeter cyst doesn't grow and then you don't have a chance that it's this big. Okay. Perfect. So one of the questions um, that you guys had was, are there any negative side effects to birth control? What should they be aware of when it comes to that? Yeah, so the biggest negative is that estrogens can cause blood clots. And so anytime I see a young lady who I'm thinking about starting a birth control pill on, I talk to her a little bit about her family history and does she know that there's people in her family who are having blood clots in their legs and lungs? Um, and because that clotting disorder in a family would increase her risk potentially. Um, it's about one in 3,500, so it's low if there's no family history. But if there is a family history, then I would consider not using that form of control for her. Um, also, migraine headaches can predispose a little bit to um, that clotting issue in young ladies. And so we do a thorough history about, are you gonna have issues with these clots? So that's my biggest concern for most ladies. Some people get moody. And so I typically warn people this first month, you're gonna be a little moody. This is not your normal hormone level. Yeah. It's uh, nice to know ahead of time before you're totally irrational. <laughs> like that. And typically it levels and most people are fine, but some ladies this causes an increase in depression or sadness or anger. So and if they're already having issues with that or predisposed. They should bring it up so that I know to follow to closer yeah. and that we are thinking this through as we start it so that we have a plan in place of if this gets bad, you're gonna do X. Mm -hmm. But most of the time within that month, you level out and things are okay again. Um, some ladies get upset stomach. 
And so these hormones, you've never taken them by mouth. And most people, if they're taking a combined birth control pill, are taking that by mouth, and that can cause nausea. And so we talk a little bit about what am I going to do if I'm having an upset stomach for this and that I don't eat because of my stomach's hurting. Yeah. That can be a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, what's the normal age for most women to start their periods and when, when are they old enough that they should talk with the doctor if they haven't started? And so most ladies start their periods by age 11. It's gradually getting a little younger as society changes. Um, I have a daughter that's about to be 11, so that breaks my heart a little bit. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> um, I know it's coming, but just to hear you confirm it, I'm like, oh. There you go. 15 is the age that we start to worry about. Okay why hasn't a period started. Um, and so if there's no period by age 15 or actually two years after the start of breast development, then we would consider looking into why isn't the period happening. Okay, that's good to know. Do you guys have any more questions about like periods or gynecology stuff? So we talked a lot about the negative effects but what are more positive effects to birth control besides helping irregular periods and um, acne control? Um, so the majority of the time I'm using it really for period regulation. Um, okay. The dermatologist uses it a good bit for acne control and I see ladies in conjunction with them sometimes for that, but a lot of times they'll start it on their own and it works great for acne control. Um, when I think of it, I think of it as I can predict my life. Mm. based on my birth control pill. And so I talk to ladies about this is the way the pill's packaged and this is when the period comes and you can basically, most ladies after they've done this for years, they can predict within a half of a day the period starting most cycles, which That's is awesome. awesome. Um, Long-term cancer risks are affected potentially by birth control. Um, we worry that maybe we're increasing breast cancer risk a little bit. It's theoretic still. But since breast cancers are getting younger, we wonder if birth control has some relation to that. Um, but it is proven to decrease the rate of ovarian, uterine, and colon cancers. So three big okay. benefits. Yeah, that's great. That's really good, yeah. And speaking of cancer, those were some questions that were brought up as well. Yeah. Um, like, what about family histories of cancer, and what's your risk if you've had family members with cancer? And so. Cancer is interesting because there are definitely some genes that predispose people to cancers. Those are thought to be the minority of the cancers. And so less than 10% of cancers are because you inherited a specific gene that caused that cancer um, or the inability of the body to correct itself from making that cancer. Most cancers are actually a combination of things that have went on in that person's life and exposure related. But when we take a history, and so seeing your doctor regularly and updating them on your family history is important because there are certain cancers that I realize if your mom had breast cancer and her sister has ovarian cancer and her mom has breast cancer, yes, there's a gene that links those. And so maybe we need to talk to you about being screened for that gene, even knowing that's way less likely that it's a combination, but if there's that many people that person, on the same be. side of the family, this is something we might should mm -hmm. talk to you about. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them don't make sense, like breast and ovaries, we are like, oh yeah, those go together. But uterus and colon go together too, and so people don't always connect that my grandma had colon cancer and her daughter had uterine cancer right. and so that might be a syndrome too and so it's important as you're going through these histories what that you update mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. your mom is young and so the odds that her and her sisters have had a cancer are lower mm -hmm. just based on age yeah but as they age the odds go up and so it's important to update your history with your doctor as those things occur mm -hmm. You mentioned something about exposure like we think it might be exposure to certain things what can teenagers avoid that they might be exposed to that could predispose them to cancer or increase their chances of getting it. And so cigarette smoke, tobacco use, um, sun, overuse of the sun, fake stop sun. Stop tanning. <laughs> yeah, stop tanning. Um, do you guys have friends that go tanning? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. It's so bad. If I remember being a teenager, we would lather ourselves with baby oil and sit out in the sun for three hours. I can't That's believe sweet. we did that. Yeah. It makes me so mad at myself right now. So um, if I could go back and tell my 15-year-old self to not do something, that would be one of the things on the list. So now, yeah. you guys, you guys know better, it sounds like, and yeah. tell your friends, too, to not. Skin too? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, I was going to say, like, there's like a yeah. lot of... Skin, skin cancer, wrinkles. aging. Yeah. 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 All of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to look like a wrinkly old bag. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> 30. <laughs> um, also, um, unprotected sex can lead to HPV exposure. And so it's one of the ones where we have a vaccine that can help to prevent a cancer. And so... At yeah. what age should that vaccine be given? Um, we start after the age of nine. Um, and up to now, the age of 45, it's been approved. And it's called? And it's called Gardasil. So for all parents out there and for teenagers watching, something to consider and talk with your doctor about? Yeah. Correct. And long term, we're seeing a decreased rate of cervical cancers because of it. And then HPV is known to cause some other head and neck cancers that we're also trying to prevent with a vaccine. And so that's one way of preventing the hepatitis B vaccine actually decreases the rate of liver cancer as well. Uh -huh. And so some of those mm -hmm. vaccines are actually helping to prevent a lifetime risk of cancer. So when it comes to teenagers, um, you know, we often think about like kids and their immunization schedule, but what vaccines or boosters do teenagers need? Um, so Other than Gardasil. So Gardasil, a yearly flu shot, um, you start worrying about exposure to large groups with college. Mm -hmm. And so the meningococcal vaccine is given to teenagers. Um, study abroad, you have to think about what things I would need if I'm going out of country, I'm doing a mission. Um, most of those can be addressed either with your family medicine doc or with the local health department. But anytime you're leaving the country, that you should think about what you, you need think about of what where you're you need going. for where mm -hmm. you're going. And that starts to happen in the teenagers a lot. So along with cancer, what symptoms might someone need to look for and when should they get checked out? Um, so in this is a pretty broad topic. It is. <laughs> for, yeah. for, for, um, so what are the, the types of cancers that might affect teenagers and young adults most commonly? Um, and so there, cancers are rare in the adolescent teenage categories. Lymphomas and leukemias are higher. They tend to be younger. Um, from my standpoint, we worry about ovarian, but that's really like 2% of cancers. That's like three in 100,000 young ladies get an ovarian cancer. And so super rare. Um, breast cancers are also very rare. But if you noticed a change, and so we're really looking for something that's different. My skin has a spot that's changing. My breast has a lump that's growing. Um, I'm having pain in one spot. That's not going that's away. That's not going mm -hmm. away over time. Um, then that's when you, ask somebody. And a lot of times these things are in areas that you don't want people to see, but realize- Back to awkward conversations and things <laughs> that you're talking you go. about. Right? <laughs> but realize- yeah, But you should to, bring it up. To us, that's a daily thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I don't remember one person's body versus the next mm -hmm. because that's what I do every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I would much prefer you tell me than to walk away from my you office. You just want to help them. Yeah, to walk away from my office with you came in and we talked about periods and really you have a spot on your breast that I should have looked, like, looked mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. So it's important to be honest when you're giving your history and answering questions. Um, you know, one of the things that has come up is I was a labor and delivery nurse for 11 years and I talked with people about how in the beginning it was awkward because they didn't want their mom to know, but moms and parents frequently take you to your appointment. And so how do you approach that if you have something you want to bring up with a doctor but you don't want your parents to know? Um, so I try to designate a time that I'm going to ask mom to leave. And that's pretty standard. Um, I especially do this at the first visit just mm -hmm. because I don't know if there's something you need to tell me. Mm -hmm. um, that's good to know that it's standard for parents and for teenagers alike. You can expect to have a moment with the doctor to talk to yeah. them about things one-on-one. -on -one. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing is you're typically given a paper at the doctor's visit. Um, and so you can indicate things on that paper that you'd like to talk about in private. Um, and that way you're not saying in front of mom, I want you to leave, but you're gonna write that paper hopefully yourself and then you're gonna hand it directly to me 
and I'm going to look at it and now make some excuse for why mom needs to leave the room if that paper says, I want to talk to you alone. Yeah. Um, and that way I know you're getting what you're wanting. But routinely I say, I just need to ask her like three questions. Do you mind to step to the hall? Yeah. And moms always say, sure. They look at me like, what are you doing? But <laughs> you're supposed to be on my side. <laughs> I, I think that's important too, because um, I've actually like seen a lot of people, you know, they don't ask their doctor questions mm -hmm. because they're scared of like what they're gonna think of them and what the other people are gonna think. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, if it's something serious, like it's better to ask your doctor beforehand than go home and like not have it anything Addressed, done yeah because yeah. well like that's scary mm -hmm. so I think it's very important for like teens to know like it's okay to like be open with your doctor about anything yeah absolutely yeah. definitely no really good point okay so um talked about lowering cancer risk we talked oh another question was about um coming off of certain medications and so mm -hmm. let's talk about the use of medication and should you stop should you not on your own okay um, so, medications are prescribed for a symptom or a disease that you've presumably been diagnosed with. Um, the goal is to take them as prescribed, and a lot of times you can get side effects that you didn't realize were possible by taking them not as prescribed. And I'll use my field as an example. I give you a birth control pill, I tell you to take it every day, you take it every day at the same time, it's supposed to make the periods very predictable. If you start changing those times, and today I take it at 9 a.m. and tomorrow I take it at 9 p.m. and the next day I take it kind of sometime in the middle, it changes that hormone that we were trying to make it level and lets it start to change and you get a period in the middle. And so if you're not taking it as prescribed, you get a side effect that you weren't expecting. Um, if you decide to stop it, that will have a side effect too. And so before you decide to stop something that was specifically prescribed to you, it's important to, to contact the doctor that prescribed it. Um, just because we don't want you to have a side effect from stopping the medicine. Or if it's for an infection, we don't want you to create a bacteria that's resistant because you didn't finish that medication. Oh, that's a good thing to bring up. Yeah, you might feel better 24 to 48 hours after you started it, but you need to continue it for as many days as they prescribed it to you. Yeah, even if you're feeling good. Yeah. Even if it's better, yeah. but we don't want yeah. that bacteria to get stronger because you only selected the weakest ones to kill. Yeah. When you were talking about birth control and side effects, it also reminded me that a lot of people associate weight gain with birth control. And we talked last week a lot about like dieting and exercising yeah. and body image and everything. So if a teenage girl goes on birth control and then she starts to gain weight, she may automatically attribute it to the birth control, rightfully so or not? No, um, so the data says that birth control pills are not responsible for weight gain. There is a Depo-Provera shot which is used for birth control and some menstrual control as well, that is associated with weight gain. And the average person gains five pounds in a year, but the remainder of our birth controls aren't significantly associated with weight gain. But I mentioned your stomach's upset. And so I warn people that this month, as you're starting this pill, you need to be conscious that my stomach's hurting, I'm not eating bread to get my stomach not to hurt because a lot of yeah, us do comfort foods eating yeah. Carbs. Yeah. when our yeah. stomach hurts. The other thing is, even if we're starting a birth control for contraception purposes, that typically means we started eating more frequently with a male um, who doesn't eat the same food items as females. <laughs> yeah. And so if you start yeah. eating pizza and wings every night, and typically you would have had a salad and some chicken, the calorie content there is different. And so there are other things that happen when birth control pills are started for some people that can contribute to weight gain, not necessarily yeah, the pill. Yeah, they may not be exploring all the other possible causes in their yeah. life, other changes. They're just attributing it to the medication alone. Um, so good to know. I also have another question about um, birth control. And what's the like, what are some things to look forward to like when you end it? Like if you want to stop using birth control, what are some changes that you might see in your body? Um, so when you stop, you start a period because yeah. stopping the pill decreases the hormone level and the bleeding will happen. Mm -hmm. It can take a couple of months for the cycle to regulate, but the time to return to fertility is the same. And so the average female, if she has unprotected sex for a year, is pregnant 85% of the time. Mm -hmm. And even if you stopped that pill, that doesn't change. 
And so people are under the impression that there's a lag and it's not statistically significant. Most people are ovulating within two months. This is why you can conceive while taking the birth control pill because you missed a day or you took it at the wrong time. Or, or you forgot to times. start it yeah. back for you were yeah. three days late picking up your pack because it yeah. doesn't actually prevent after it's stopped. And so yeah. return to fertility isn't affected by having been on the pill. That's one of the things people get worried about. I've taken this for five years. Oh no, I'm not gonna be able to have a baby because I was on a pill. That's not true. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, the reason you started the pill probably didn't disappear. And so I've talked to a lot of ladies about they've been on a pill, then they got off the pill, they had a baby, and then now their periods are abnormal again. And they're irregular, or they're having cysts, or they're having pain with their periods from endometriosis. And those things don't necessarily go away while you were on the pill. We were just controlling their symptoms. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. And do you, is there anything like, because, um, you know, as you said, like while starting the like birth control, you can go through like mood swings or like, you know, your acne or whatever. Is that the same when you get off of it or can, does that just like um, stay? Sometimes there's a little bit of change of the skin. Yes. The mood swings tend to not be as much unless your mood was changed by the pill. I have people that definitely have less PMS type symptoms on a pill. And so if you stopped so that, that, it would potentially... So that side effect gets better, right. not worse. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Are there any other questions that you have while we have Dr. Smith here and all of our expertise? Um, what age would you suggest that we would go and see a gynecologist <coughs> would um, be a good time? So any time there's a problem once menses has started or that the periods haven't started. Okay. Um, if you have concerns about heavy, painful, too frequent, not enough, of course, see us. We don't necessarily <coughs> make you come back. A lot of times I do a short visit, we talk about it, I tell you you're normal and send you on your way to come back when there's something you're worried about <coughs> again. And that's completely okay. Um, if we have decided that we're having sex, it's important that we're protecting you. Um, and okay. so we should talk about sexually transmitted infections, preventing pregnancy, all of those things. It's a very important time. Or if there's a possibility of that happening. Um, but reality is, if you're just thinking, hey, something's up with my period, we're happy to see you for that. It's one of the best visits of my day. I have <laughs> visits about how to put in tampons, is my period okay? Are my breast sizes different? I mean, all of those visits, it's perfect. And I'm happy to educate and either tell you, hey, that's completely normal, or no, I'm worried too, let's get some more tests. Mm -hmm. okay. What are some, um, sorry, I'm going back to birth control. Mm -hmm. Good. What are some like, mis do you have, well, I guess in general, like misconceptions that people have about women's health? Um, and specifically birth control, people think if you're taking birth control, you're having sex. Mm -hmm. And so the majority of my birth control that I prescribe is not anything to do with sex. It's we to do with periods. We've a lot of other reasons to be taking it. Right, and so pain and bleeding and lots of reasons to take a birth control pill, nothing to do with sex. Um, the other thing is that you're gonna undress when you come to the office. And so under the age of 21, I did not have to do a pap smear on you. I can screen you for sexually transmitted infections. I can ask you about your menstrual cycle. I can order an ultrasound to look at your ovaries. There are lots of things I can do without you having to undress. And so if you make that appointment to talk about periods, there's nothing that says I'm gonna make you be naked on a table. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the big misconceptions is that I'm giving up all of my privacy and really I just have one question. Okay. That's really good to know. Yeah. Lower the fear level around going to the yeah, doctor, right? I've, I've just had a lot of like people have fears about mm -hmm. going in and like talking about it. So that's why I was just asking because you know they, a lot of things get like mixed up. Mm -hmm. talking. Absolutely, and that's one of the common things. Like I walk in the room and I can see, <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, "You're okay. I'm probably not making you undress. Let's just talk a minute." <laughs> and then their guard co probably comes yeah, down. Yeah, and then we can really talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, good questions. Any others that you guys might have? I feel fully educated. <laughs> I, I, I think that was a lot a of good thing. information. Yeah. Dr. Smith, do you have anything sure. else that you think teens should know about in general? Oh, I think this was an excellent discussion. Yeah, me yeah. too. Absolutely. Well, hopefully it's been helpful to everyone who's watching, not only for teenagers, but also for moms yeah. because 
It's been a little while since we were teenagers, and sometimes we need to be reminded of what it's like, and exactly. and um, that helps us to support you guys as best as we can, too. Yeah, absolutely. So, thank you so much, you guys. Your project is amazing. <laughs> thank I you. I am just so impressed with each one of you. And thank you, Dr. Smith, for taking some time to be with us today. Um, of course, you guys know if you have questions, you can send me a message on Facebook. If it's related to this, you can post it below the video, and we'll answer as many of them as we can.